Monster Team, a Hellblazer podcast. Hey there, everybody. Before we get into the issue, I just wanted to let you guys know that this is the free version of the podcast. And all that means is that this is far behind where I'm at in the Patreon version. So if you're liking this and you need more John Constantine, you can't get enough. Be sure to go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up for the Hellblazer tier, which gives you access to the entire Hellblazer library that I've done so far, and a new Hellblazer podcast every week. And you'll also get the exclusives from our main planes, trains, and comic books podcasts. So if any of that interests you, definitely check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word. And with that, let's get into the issue. Today, we are reading issue 16 of Hellblazer, and just to catch up with what happened last time... John Constantine is hanging out with a bunch of travelers. He is on the run from the police in London because they think he killed all of his neighbors that lived in his flat house. So he's been with these travelers for a month or two, and he's been getting to know them. There's a bunch of people that traveled all together in these vans. They're kind of counterculture people that do a lot of psychedelics and whatnot. And they also know a lot about magic, specifically like earth magic, like ley lines and energy vortexes and stuff that are connected to the earth and also how humans have used these magics over the years specifically through things like stones being laid in certain patterns like stonehenge and whatnot so as john's been learning about this kind of stuff he and a young girl named mercury who's also magical they run into one of these stone formations that have been surrounded by a company and it seems like the company is either destroying the magics or using it for their own benefits and draining the earth powers that might be there and we ended the last issue with the police about to attack the encampment of these travelers as john was getting back from a psychedelic trip he had so that's where we're going to pick up but first things first we got the cover here for hellblazer number 16 there's like this dirty orange kind of tan haze on the cover and through that haze we can see a bridge with the sun coming up behind it and someone is actually hanging from the bridge like by their neck they're dead for sure and Over that, we see like a a faint outline of two people embracing like in anguish or sadness. And it's probably, it looks like John and possibly Mercury. And this issue is written by Jamie Delano, art by Richard Pierce Rayner and Mark Buckingham. And we start off on the first page with a man with glasses being thrown off of a bridge with a noose tied around his neck and he's about to die. And we see the name of this issue is called Rough Justice. This is the third part of the Fear Machine story arc. And we have seen this person before. He was one of the company men that Mercury and John ran into that were trying to fence off and steal or corrupt the power stones that run along the magical ley lines of the earth. And then we see on the next page that it's actually a dream that Mercury was having about that man. And she definitely has some kind of psychic ability that can like either tell the future or whatever, but she had like a wrestling match in her mind with that specific man who she calls Fungus Face. And they were kind of like looking at each other like scanner style where they're like, like, like wrestling in their minds against each other. And ever since then, she has been having visions of him being pushed off this bridge with a noose around his neck and dying. So as she wakes up and she kind of gets more acquainted with her surroundings, she starts to look around and sees John and her mother in bed together. And she actually smiles. She likes John a lot. And, you know, this is kind of a uh, hippie kind of family. So she doesn't have like a traditional attitude towards sex. At least she doesn't look at them and go like, ew, or gross or whatever she's like oh it's sweet that they're together and she seems maybe that she doesn't quite understand boundaries and whatnot because as she thinks about her sister and john and how she how much she likes that relationship she kind of tries to get into bed with them just to i guess be close to her sister and john but right as she is about to get under the covers a baton smashes through the window of their van and we find out it is the police breaking in. They are just coming in without a warrant or anything. They're saying that they have probable cause because they're on private land. But these people, the travelers, the whole group of them get permission from the landowners to be there. So this is actually all a cover in order to get Mercury. 
and the man she calls fungus face that she was wrestling with her mind is behind this police raid they're actually not real police they're just kind of dressed up and impersonating police but at this moment no one knows that john just kind of gets up and he's buck naked <laughs> and we see we see the tattoo on his butt again which is great they just kind of include that in every panel just to give a wink and a nod to the Swamp Thing fans in the audience. And as John tries to fight with them in order to protect Mercury, uh, they just begin beating him with batons and whatnot. These fake police definitely have a mission, and that mission is to get Mercury away from this whole group of travelers. And they're able to do that. They kind of beat on everybody as they're pulling Mercury and her mom away and into a transport van. And Constantine is fighting so hard that he actually gets knocked out completely. And that kind of allows the police to finally get Marge and Mercury in the van. Now, keep in mind, Marge is completely naked because they woke her up and took her before she could put clothes on because she was in bed with Constantine. And so, so Mercury is the only one with clothes. Marge just has a blanket wrapped around her. And while they're sitting there, Mercury can hear the thoughts of the faux police that are in this transport van with them. And they're thinking about possibly raping Marge because she's naked. And also they're like, well, who's going to stop us? We're not even really police. And this thought really freaks Mercury out, understandably. And she just continues to fight and try to get away but they do pull out some drugs that they give to marge and they just kind of release her after they give the drugs because she's so docile and whatever and they just tell her don't worry we're gonna take mercury on a holiday and she'll be fine and then marge is just like all right sounds good and they also drug mercury as well in order to get her to calm down so then we cut back to constantine who is just waking up and he's kind of figuring out what happened to the group and kind of assessing all the damage that was done by these fake police. It looks like a bunch of their cars are damaged and they're going to need to stay there for repair for a while. But John is all pissed off now. He He's had enough of this. Him being a very powerful magician is like, I'm going to take care of these motherfuckers now. So unfortunately, because all the vehicles are broken down, he has to walk the five miles into town. But before he starts off, luckily, Eddie gives him a shortcut and says, it's five miles by road or it's two miles if you walk the countryside. All you got to do is follow the ley line. So he like points Constantine in the general direction of where he's supposed to go. And Constantine starts walking. And after a bit, he runs into a very weird scene that happens to be next to a church. There's a large crowd of people and we see a very, very bloody and cut up cow that seems to have somehow gotten into a greenhouse and all the glass from the greenhouse broke and is like shattered around it. So Constantine goes up to one of the people in the crowd and says, hey, what's going on? And I'll do my best to try to tell you what happened. But because the man he asked has such a strong accent and there's a lot of words that I guess are maybe specifically British that he uses as slang. I'm like, I kind of get what he's talking about, but I'm not exactly sure 100% exactly what happened. So uh, from what I can tell, there was a man who was chasing his sister Flora with a knife and also a cow, I guess named Gwyneth and it turns out that man is I guess the pastor or the vicar they call him of a church where the greenhouse is located he chased them into this greenhouse and shouting that Satan had come for her and then he began to stab the cow which made the cow freak out and trample her to death and I guess also break all the glass in the greenhouse and then the man John is talking to is actually uh, I guess the caretaker of the church and he came out and had to shoot the cow because he thought it was rabbit or something. That is my best interpretation of what, of what he said. Like I said, there's a lot of slang and other kind of words in there that I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. But John understands him because he's British. <laughs> so, so he's like, oh, okay, sounds really weird. And I will put that on the list of things to just remember that happened that are very odd and seem very dark and ominous. So John eventually makes it into the town where he thinks the police have taken Marge and Mercury. But when he goes there... The officer at the reception is telling him, we didn't arrest any women last night. I don't even know what you're talking about. We only picked up one crazy lady, and I mean, you can look at her if you want. And as the officer says that, he kind of points towards the door that uh, the woman is in, and we see that it's actually Marge that they have, and they think she's crazy because she's naked and all drugged up. So whenever she talks, she's kind of saying nonsense and just 
not able to answer the police's questions coherently. And even to John, she's not making any sense. And then out of another holding room, another police officer opens the door and we can hear someone yelling and it turns out it's the vicar from the murder scene before with the cow and everything. And he's being held and he's yelling, Satan wanted my sister. And so like the police are just kind of like, hey, we're too busy to deal with this crazy lady. Uh, so we're not arresting her or anything. So you can take her. Uh, and I'll just look the other way. And as he's saying that, another police officer comes in because the man John was talking to is actually about to leave. His shift is over. So the man who's going to replace him looks very familiar to John. And that's because he was the security guard from the last issue who was guarding the stones that the company was putting a fence around and draining it of its magic. And he doesn't recognize John, though. But John just kind of makes a mental note and says, like, okay, that's the security guard from the woods, and this is getting dodgier, so he better get Marge out while he can. So they let John take Marge into his custody, and he actually brought clothes for her, so she's not naked anymore, and he, he lets her get dressed, and then they leave. He actually stops at a gentleman's outfitters, and he buys something that's wrapped very fancily, and then he takes a cab with Marge and goes back to the traveler's camp. And everyone is very impressed that Constantine was able to get at least Marge back, and so they take Marge and they're kind of saying, oh, are you okay? Where's Mercury? They're catching up with her. And John goes to talk to Eddie, who is in like a sweat lodge that he made. And John goes in there and kind of fills Eddie in on what had happened. And then Eddie tells John that he actually knew what happened with Merc and him the other day at the woods with the ley line stones. And Eddie actually went back to the spot to see what the company had done because Mercury told him what was going on. And when he got there, he says that the ley line was all messed up. A positive charge turned into a black stream. Negative energy. Very dangerous psychically. And that place she said you guys saw, it was gone. Completely gone. Dismantled. Nothing was there. The ecosystem's hanging by a thread, and now they're even messing with ley lines. So then John asks, well, what can we do about it? And Eddie seems kind of like, oh, we can't really do anything uh, we got nowhere to fight them. We don't have any clout in their world. And John's like, I don't know. You've got magic, haven't you? And then we cut to sometime later, like an hour or so. And Eddie is telling the rest of the group the plan that he came up with, spurred on by Constantine to use magic and whatnot. So he's saying, so we're all in agreement. We're going to move to Scotland and we're going to link up with the pagan nation who are some pretty far out eco gorillas. But this plan doesn't sit good with everybody. Sam, in particular, she I think she's a lawyer or something, or was, because she's like, we can't fight these guys with magic. We need to organize lawyers and stuff. We need to work in their system. And this starts an argument where everybody's kind of split on whether they should use lawyers and work within the normie system, or whether they should use magic and kind of do it their way. And it seems like maybe some of the people don't quite think magic is at least powerful enough to deal with something like this. Even Marge comes in and is like, you guys are talking a load of crap with your magic. This isn't a boy's own adventure. It's real life. The pigs beat us up and Mercury's been disappeared. Yeah, Mercury, remember her? Who's going to magic her back? And then like a total badass, <laughs> who should show up at this moment? But Constantine, he wasn't in this group prior. And now we hear someone say, me. And when we turn the page, we see Constantine is revealed in his new getup. He has had a haircut, so his hair is all short now because it was all long and scruffy. He had a beard before, and now that's all shaved. And now he pretty much looks like someone who should be in the Matrix. He's got a long black trench coat. He's wearing all black clothes, and he's wearing these sunglasses. It's night, of course, so he's wearing sunglasses at night, which is always cool in the 80s. And everybody is surprised at how badass he is. He's just like, I'm going to get her back. And she's like, John, what have you done to yourself? You look sort of sinister. And John's like, good. I feel sinister. <laughs> and she kind of tells him like, look, you don't have to do this. This isn't your problem. And don't feel like you have to do it. And he's like, you know what? No, I want to do it. I liked it here. It was nice. And they spoiled it. And when my friends get hurt, I take it personally, which is great coming from Constantine because every one of his friends from the past has been murdered or killed because of Constantine's actions. <laughs> and everybody is thoroughly impressed that John has volunteered to do this and that he looks so badass. So, so Marge takes Constantine to the local train station to go back to London. And as he's buying a ticket, we see that someone is following him and he actually notices. So Constantine is aware that some guy is actually following him. So then we cut to Mercury, who is now being held in some sort of, looks like a hospital room maybe or something, 
and she is still passed out. She's having a dream again of someone dying, and it's someone that she calls the crying man, and the narration says, Mercury's mind is awake a good half hour before her body, and all that time the person sobbing does not pause for breath. It's a horrible sound, not a child, a man, so alone, so very alone and scared. Mercury wants to sit up and comfort him, but her body's numb and she can't even move her arm. And as it says arm, her arm actually really moves and she wakes up and she slaps a pitcher of water off the table next to her bed. And then she gets up because she's kind of surprised and the sobbing has stopped. It says her face feels fat and sweaty and she wants to wash. So she gets up off the bed and there's a sink in her room with a mirror. And as she stands in front of the sink and starts to turn on the faucets, she looks up at the mirror and sees the crying man staring back at her in the mirror. And she freaks out because he grabs some scissors that aren't really there and begins to stab himself in the eyes. And then blood starts pouring out of the sink and everything. And she starts freaking out and falls backwards. And then a man bursts in the door and tries to calm her down. And he's like, you're okay. You're safe, child. It's fine. And she's like, his eyes, his eyes were bleeding. And she has her eyes closed tight as this man kind of tries to calm her down and comfort her. And he pulls her head onto his shoulder. And she at first is comforted. But we can see that it is actually the man that she calls Fungus Face. But it's the guy that she was mind wrestling with earlier at the ley line fenced in area. And when she realizes it's him, she freaks out and she's like, no, stop it. You're a liar. And he says, now don't get frightened again. And she goes, I'm not frightened, but you should be because I know what happens to you. Shall I show you? And then she pushes, I guess, the dreams that she's been having of him hanging from the bridge. She pushes those images into his mind so he can see his body falling, the rope tighten as he reaches the end of the length of it, and then his head getting ripped off completely as his body continues to fall, but his head does not. So, of course, this freaks him out, and he has to leave the room, and he's, like, crying. And then, uh, I guess his boss or another guy that he works with comes up and says, Fulton, what's the matter with you? And he's like, sorry, sir, I had to get some air. I felt faint. And then his boss asks, well, is she talented enough? Is she going to be worth the risk we took in acquiring her? I hear the men were a little vigorous. So there's obviously some sort of overarching bad corporation plot here where they know that Mercury is some kind of special psychic and they're going to use that to tap into some power with the ley lines. And while they're talking, we get some narration that kind of gives us insight into Mercury and her thought process. It says, Mercury doesn't feel the slightest bit sorry for what she did. He asked for it. They shouldn't have brought her here. Being locked up doesn't scare her. She's been locked up before. When Marge got sick and they took her into care, you just have to be tough. She might look like a little girl, but sometimes she feels very old indeed. Mercury knows that she's strong enough, but it's Marge who's the problem. She's worried to death about Marge. Still, John will be looking after her, won't he? And that's the end of the issue. If you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com, and we will see y'all on the next one.